Wildfire is the most dramatic enemy of our forest. Extreme weather conditions, dry fuels, and strong shifting winds sometimes create monstrous fires which seem to defy control. On these bad days, relatively few fires burn most of the forest acreage lost during the entire year. A fire which escapes early control in hazardous times may be compared to a wild animal. It runs, attacks, sneaks, retreats, and surprises. Suppression forces must attack where a wildfire retreats, secure those parts which sneak, prepare in advance areas where the fire is expected to move, guide it to a natural break when it runs, and finally mop it up when it smolters. The suppression job grows until the fire is corralled by an absence of fuel, oxygen, heat, or a combination of these factors. Creation of such a corral or fire line demands a crescendo of organization, teamwork, and skilled effort. Although no two forest fires are alike and each suppression effort must be designed for the fire at hand, there is a standard approach to project fire organization. Playing the County Ranger, you have a fire at block 12, square 16.9. It has just escaped from a burning field and burned about one acre of wood. It has project fire potential. Okay, Scout Plane, I'm on my way. County Ranger to Tractor 1, meet me at that location as quick as possible. Will do, County Ranger. County Ranger to District Operations. Can you send me another tractor? We'll need retarded drops, too. Okay, County Ranger. I will send tractor and request aerial support from regional operations. Okay. Regional operations, we need three small aerial anchors with retarded on County Ranger fire at block 12, square 16.9. Extreme weather conditions make this a grave day in North Carolina forest. So far, North Carolina Forest Service suppression forces seem prepared. Let's observe Project Fire Organization as this fire boss creates and expands his suppression organization. Certain organizational prerequisites must be accomplished before fire emergencies if organization of suppression forces is to succeed. First, there must be a fire plan. Fire plans list who and what is available, how to get personnel and equipment to a fire, and the best attack plans for those situations which can be predicted. Trained project fire teams with individual job qualifications provide a ready nucleus for project fire organization. Second, there must be readiness of equipment. Regular inspection and testing by checklists assure efficient mechanical conditioning. Readiness also means everything loaded, in place, and operators ready for instant dispatch. The third prerequisite is training. Each fire crewman must be prepared to handle as many duties beyond his regular job as his abilities allow. Fourth, communications. Communications is the best barometer of how well an operation is organized. Message priorities must be established. Messages should be thought out or written out before transmitting. 
as many systems of communications as practical should be employed. If these prerequisites are not accomplished before a fire emergency, suppression organization is difficult, frustrating, and inefficient. The fire boss must approach every fire keenly aware of the overall job. Control of any fire requires integration of three specific functions, line, plans, and service. Line functions control manpower, tools, and equipment, and apply them to the fire as directed by the suppression plan prescribed by the fire boss. Plans functions provide the fire boss contingency plans for suppressing the fire. Such plans are arrived at by collecting and evaluating information, keeping records, operating the communication center, and procuring manpower. Service functions are those required to provide for the feeding, sleeping, supply, communications, transportation, and maintenance of the entire fire suppression force. County Ranger to District Operations. I have reached the fire and scouted it briefly. I need two large air tankers to lay a retardant line, three snows to catch spot fires, and the volunteer fire department on roads 1304. Send three crew bosses, nine crewmen with backfire torches, and two tractor ply units. Okay, County Ranger, we'll do. Sam, I want you to take my notes and continue them as a fire log. Ask the air scout to drop us a rough map of the fire perimeter and add any new breaks or woods roads to the aerial photographs. Keep the fire progress map up as best you can. I'll handle the line functions. You take care of the plans and service functions. Okay, we'll do. If we don't get it with this effort, we're going to have a big one on our hands. This has become a three crew fire with aerial support. The ranger's assistant has taken over basic functions of plans and service while the ranger concentrates his attention to line functions in a desperate effort to make early initial attacks succeed. On a two or three crew fire, the fire boss will spend most of his time planning line location and directing suppression activities. So far, all line construction on this fire is continuous and along one segment or sector of the fire perimeter. A sector is a piece of ground designated by the fire boss or line boss to identify that area for reference purposes. It is the area between two specific points. Crews may move from one sector to a new sector, but any particular sector designated will identify the same piece of ground until the fire is out. District operations to County Ranger. Fire weather forecaster Raleigh informs us that the dry cold front forecast earlier is approaching. Wind will shift from south to southwest your area. At approximately 1630, gusting to 35 miles per hour. Okay, district operations. Sam, get with a scout plane and fly the fire. We need a good map before the wind shifts. Put in every road, trail, pond, stream, field, and building, or any other important ground feature. Pay particular attention east to south of the fire. You will take over his plans, boss, as soon as they get a service, boss. Okay, I'm on my way. County Ranger to District Operations, I need a line boss and a service boss. Prepared to work through the night. I will continue as fire boss. We will need three sector bosses also. Temporary fire headquarters will be at the intersection of State Road 1304 and 1500. The fire boss is wisely devoting his attention to the overall fire problem. He recognized the signs of a project fire early. The threat of a dry cold front, wind shift, and high winds has quickly shifted his thinking from initial attack to project fire planning. Step by step, he must expand his suppression forces, develop a system for gathering information, and provide for their service and supply. He must bring this fire under control with a minimum of man hours and money expended. The fire boss immediately delegates all fire line construction responsibilities to his new line boss. Well, why don't you take a look at this map 
He reviews in detail all plans which have been initiated, the location of all crews and equipment, the adverse fire weather expected, and strategy for the next few hours. A rough map and notes regarding fuels, topography, access points, escape routes, and requested manpower and equipment are turned over to the line boss. Hello, Frank. Howdy. Here you need a service boss. I need everything. Time is squeezing us hard, and uh, we're expecting a wind shift at 1630. I believe we'll have 25 tarred, hungry men just east of this sawdust pile by 1730. I'd like for them to have plenty of hot coffee and food before they get any farther off the road. Try to round up some canteens of water. Okay, I'll get right on it. I'll announce that you're taking over the service boss. Line boss to fire boss. Tractor 6 and Tractor 7 have arrived. I'm designating the area from the fire headquarters to the bridge on road 1304 as Sector 1. Joe Miller is Sector 1 boss. The area from that bridge, due east, one mile to the sawdust pile, will be Sector 2. Jim Owens will be Sector 2 boss. And the area from the sawdust pile south to fire headquarters will be Sector 3. Bob Campbell is Sector 3 boss. We're concentrating aerial drops and plowing on Sector 3. We hope it will hold as the front passes. Okay, line boss, I'm designating Sam Taylor as plans boss, and I'll give this information to him. That completes the skeleton organization for a two or three sector fire. The forest departments of the wood-using industries have well-equipped fire control organizations, which supplement state forest service forces in protecting forest resources. These competent industrial crews attend forest service training schools and learn to function as integral parts of the big fire team. On a project fire, a primary consideration of the fire boss is to assign industrial crews, whenever possible, to those sectors of the fire which most directly threaten company interest. Company personnel know their own lands best and can make better decisions regarding the values in jeopardy. These industrial suppression forces are under the tactical direction of the fire boss, but the forces of each company function as one or more units of the project fire organization with their own company organization and internal supervision. The workload on the fire boss demands expert help to advise him on air operations. Someone must take over all line construction responsibilities. A plans boss must collect and evaluate pertinent information and suggest specific suppression plans to the fire boss. A service boss is essential to satisfy the physical needs of the entire fire organization. Each of these functions, line, plans, and service, have many subordinate jobs to be done. They will be completely staffed only as the need for a full-time man is required for each job. District operations to plans boss. Regional operations advises that the wind shift is occurring 20 miles west of you. They expected your area 45 minutes. Okay, district operations. Plans to all fire units. Wind expected to shift to northwest about 1630, adjusting to 35 miles per hour. The line boss to airstrip boss, have all planes loaded and over the fire at 1625. Well then.
plans to district operations, the fire boss advises that the fire has jumped all lines. And is out of control. We need a project fire team and complete headquarters set up by 0500 tomorrow morning. Six more tractors, military personnel, presidents with supervisors. During the next nine hours, several hundred fire crewmen and specialists will report to fire headquarters. They will bring numerous tools and pieces of heavy equipment. The fire boss is meeting with his top staff, line boss, plans boss, service boss, and air advisor to make plans for the night and prepare for expanding the organization tomorrow. The line boss and plans boss will work through the night and be relieved by the project fire team tomorrow morning. When the fire boss and top staff meet tomorrow morning, the plans unit will have prepared current fire status reports including fire line progress, up to the minute fire perimeter maps, special weather forecast, manpower and equipment status reports, and written action plans for use by the fire boss, line boss, and others. The fire boss is on duty 24 hours a day. Being available does not mean he should go without essential rest. Swamp or Pocosin fires often die down at night to the extent that equipment cannot follow the fire line. In such situations, heavy equipment is brought to the nearest road for service. It's a very essential responsibility of the service unit to inspect, service, and refuel all vehicles systematically. All men and equipment must be in position and ready to start work at daylight. During critical fire weather, the period between daylight and mid-morning may be the only time effective work can be done on the fire line. At the early morning strategy meeting, the fire boss reminds his top staff that each key man should review the outline of his duties in the compact forest fire field manual. The strategy meeting reviews data prepared by the plans unit the night before, makes plans for the day's operation, and approves maps and assignment sheets for field distribution. Verbal instructions are too often misinterpreted. The project fire team and other manpower have been arriving all through the night. It is imperative that all personnel report at once to the timekeeper on arrival. He relays arrival information including job qualifications to the plans unit. This system enables the plans unit to assign manpower with a minimum of delay. As soon as a new arrival is assigned a job, he must be briefed on how his work will relate to the overall suppression effort operational procedures and safety. Tools must be stored for safe transportation. Personnel must be moved on vehicles with handrails and seats. Vehicles must be parked in areas safe from fire and traffic away from intersections and on one side of the road only. Success or frustration of the project fire effort may depend on wise selection of a satisfactory site for fire headquarters. All activities of the growing organization will revolve around this camp until the fire is out. Availability of telephone lines, commercial power, and access roads to fire headquarters are sometimes more important than the proximity of the fire camp to the fire. Lights must be installed for night work. Sound power phones and intercom hookups are essential for intra-sectional use in camp. Portable citizens band radios are useful for in-camp communications, too. An adequate supply of fresh water is another essential for a successful fire headquarters. Vehicle parking and maintenance areas are located on one side of camp to reduce dust and noise. The service dispatcher is quartered in the service headquarters van at the entrance to fire camp. 
The equipment clerk keeps a record of all traffic in and out of camp. Okay, I've got to find out now. The timekeeper is in a direct path between vehicle parking and camp to ensure immediate check-in of new personnel. An assembly area near the plans unit has a bulletin board with an up-to-date fire status map, plan of the day, and other pertinent information. The field kitchen has roped off areas for channeling traffic, an eating area, receptacles for garbage disposal, areas for storage and supplies. The portable power plant is an important but noisy tool. It's isolated as much as possible, particularly from sleeping areas. A plainly marked first aid kit is located near the center of camp. An ambulance vehicle with qualified first aid attendant and driver is on standby constantly. The latrine is plainly marked and isolated. If motels are not used, day and night sleeping areas are set up, usually separated by a wash area. The fire headquarters or plans unit is separated from the central camp layout to minimize noise and unnecessary distraction by routine camp activities. The fire boss's quarters are even more isolated. He must have quiet and a minimum of distraction to permit constant consideration of the fire status, anticipation and planning, development of strategy, and effective rest. Detailed description of each key project fire job is provided in the Southeastern States Forest Fire Compact Commission Forest Fire Field Manual. Each key man should refer to the manual to become thoroughly familiar with the responsibilities his assignment requires. It's necessary that all personnel have a basic knowledge of the entire project fire organization and where each job fits. The chain of command from the fire boss to the fire crewman is a good place to start. The fire boss is in full charge of and is fully responsible for all phases of the fire. His actions are limited only by legal statute and current policy. The air advisor is a specialist in the line organization who keeps abreast of all developments involving aircraft and makes appropriate recommendations to the fire boss. The line boss is responsible to the fire boss for operation of the entire line unit and construction of the fire line on the entire fire. He's a top staff member and makes decisions within limits set by the fire boss. Sector bosses are directly responsible to the line boss for all action within their sectors. They have full authority within the limits set by the fire boss. Crew bosses are responsible to the respective sector bosses for efficient planning and supervision of the work of their crews or specialists. The air attack boss is another specialist who usually serves directly under the line boss on large fires. He directs attacks by tanker planes as ordered by the line boss, controls tankers after they leave airstrip traffic patterns until they return, and coordinates with the air advisor and airstrip boss. The chain of command just described is known as the line unit. It's the force which actually applies manpower tools, and equipment to the fire perimeter to suppress the fire. Without other assistance, this force would soon be exhausted, depleted, and reduced to insufficiency. Support for the line unit is provided by the fire boss through the plans unit and service unit. Just as in the line unit, all functions of the plans unit and service unit are performed, however, individual jobs are staffed only as needed. The primary function of the plans unit is to create plans for suppressing the fire and present them to the fire boss. Second lines of attack must be constantly defined by the plans unit and made known to the fire boss and all line overhead. This allows orderly retreat to prearranged positions when a line is lost. Incidentally, as the flanks or other areas of the fire perimeter are brought under control, forces may be moved to more active sectors. However, at least a skeleton crew is kept on every sector on the fire perimeter. 
This organizational principle not only provides constant awareness of changing conditions on the whole fire perimeter, but also maintains a nucleus at the scene around which reinforcements can be quickly organized. A wise fire boss always reserves one or more suppression units for unforeseen problems. These units should stand by at an area with easy access to critical sectors. Intelligent plans are made by collecting, recording, and evaluating information. The plans unit also operates fire headquarters. Initiative is the measure of a good plans unit. The plans right, boss you know, must keep the fire boss informed. Work of the plans unit is accomplished by five sections. Liaison, information and education, law enforcement, and traffic control, intelligence, and records. Each has a section chief. The liaison chief is a go-between for the plans boss in dealing with any organized group furnishing manpower to the fire organization, such as the National Guard or Marine Corps. He maintains coordination between the top project fire staff and the commanding officer of the supporting unit. The liaison officer must keep the plans boss informed. Initiative, again, is the key word. The I and E chief keeps himself acquainted with progress of control efforts, personnel and equipment involved, cooperating agencies, and other pertinent information which he furnishes to the news media. He posts a daily summary of the fire situation on the camp bulletin board and accepts all news requests from information agencies. The I&E officer must exercise initiative. He must keep the plans boss informed. The law enforcement and traffic control chief expedites safe movement of traffic, enforces laws and investigates violations, and provides liaison with local law enforcement officers. He must keep the plans boss informed by his own initiative. The intelligence chief must direct scouting, supervise the map record clerk, review, summarize, and evaluate current scouting and weather information, furnish sketches and maps to other units as requested, secure maps needed by the fire organization, coordinate with the record section to see that scout reports and messages are noted in the fire log, maintain contact with all elements of the fire unit for information and progress reports, and see that the operations map is posted promptly, neatly, and accurately. None of this is worth the paper it's printed on unless the intelligence chief promptly furnishes information summaries to the plans boss and notifies him when a critical situation is anticipated. The records chief and his staff operate the message center for the entire organization and record all activities pertaining to the suppression effort. His fire log clerk keeps an accurate chronological record of all important actions and events of the fire and the suppression force. The personnel records clerk or timekeeper registers all incoming personnel and records all assignments until they're released. The records chief must keep the plans boss informed. Initiative is a must. The service unit is made up of five sections. Motor equipment section, communication section, supply section, camp section, and air service section. Each section has a chief or boss. A service dispatcher on the staff of the service boss monitors all traffic in and out of camp, receives all requests for supplies, and coordinates delivery with the supply section combines and coordinates all requests to the service unit, dispatches all supplies and equipment, and is responsible for the location and custody of all prison inmates in camp. First of the five service unit sections is the motor equipment section. Heavy reliance on motorized equipment has prompted the North Carolina Forest Service to enlarge and expand the equipment section in its fire plans. The compact version is primarily a motor pool. The equipment boss must furnish all elements of the fire organization sufficient motorized equipment 
and see that such equipment is serviced and maintained in a safe operating condition. He discharges this duty through the service dispatcher and a maintenance branch directed by a supervising mechanic. A records clerk is assigned to the equipment boss to maintain records showing the status of repairs and requests. The communications officer must determine and provide for communications needs for the entire suppression project. He may personally handle all work for his section, however on very large fires he may need to organize a staff of radio technicians. All items of equipment and supply requested by the fire organization are procured by the service unit as directed by the supply boss. He may divide this responsibility into four subsections. Food procurement and distribution, fuel and lube procurement and distribution, equipment and supply procurement, and tool maintenance, distribution, and salvage. The camp boss is responsible for feeding, housing, and ensuring the general welfare of all personnel of the fire organization. He may divide the camp section's work into job classes such as maintenance and housing, chief cook and helpers, and first aid attendant. The camp boss prepares and posts signs identifying all camp installations and directing personnel and vehicle movement. He must see that the chief cook prepares meals well in advance, that sanitary conditions are maintained, standard menus are followed, and receptacles for garbage and dishes are conveniently located. Hot coffee and fresh water must be available in camp at all times. The camp boss must see that the chief cook receives field lunch orders, prepares them on time and in the right quantity. Wash racks, latrines, sleeping areas, and the first aid station must be inspected frequently. The camp boss must keep the service boss informed. The last section of the service unit is the air service section, whose function is to provide all services needed for aircraft operations. The airstrip boss is the section chief, and he answers directly to the service boss. He's in charge of all planes, crews, and pilots while on the ground. The airstrip boss coordinates with all other service units, the air advisor and the air attack boss. The air traffic manager is responsible to the airstrip boss for control of all airport traffic and safety. He acts as air dispatcher, coordinates flights with plans of the air advisor, orients and briefs ground and flight crews, and maintains necessary records. At commercial airports, the air traffic manager maintains liaison with the airport manager and the official FAA airport dispatcher. All maintenance, service, and supply of aircraft is directed by the air service manager. He supervises all retardant mixing crews and operations supporting aerial delivery, the air cargo crew in the packing of food, water, and other items to be delivered by air or parachute, and keeps record of all equipment and supplies transported by aircraft. Like the plans unit, the service unit is an indispensable part of the project fire organization. Each section chief or boss must constantly anticipate arising needs and prepare contingency plans for satisfying these problems. Each section chief must evaluate the importance of details and keep the service boss informed of all significant developments. Well, there you have it. Our county ranger, whose one crew initial attack failed, has created and expanded a highly specialized and complex project fire organization as necessary until this devastating fire was controlled. A description of project fire organization would not be complete without recognizing two other possible stages of organizational expansion. 
It is conceivable that a fire could become so large that the line boss could not effectively supervise all sectors. In this case, the fire boss would probably agree for the line boss to divide the fire line into two or more segments, or divisions, with a division boss in charge of each. The division bosses would answer directly to the line boss, and the respective sector bosses would be supervised by their assigned division boss. Full authority and responsibility for directing and supervising line construction in a division rest on the division boss. All other aspects of the project fire organization would remain the same. A coordinator stage fire is the last organizational variation provided for by the Southeastern State's Forest Fire Compact Manual. This situation could most conceivably develop in mountainous or other rugged terrain where one fire might become so large or divided that it should be handled as two or more fires. In such situations, a fire coordinator or chief fire boss would be appointed to provide liaison between fires and approve and integrate the control plan for each fire to fit an overall control plan. The coordinator would dispatch equipment, personnel and supplies to each fire after weighing the needs of each fire against available resources. Each fire would have to have its own fire boss and staff developed to the degree required to effect control. The whole objective of the Project Fire Organization is to get trained people with the right tools and equipment to the right places at the right time. This requires of the fire boss a complete knowledge of those things which influence fire behavior and the total forces available to combat it. Project fires are combat missions. Men arrayed against the forces of nature. Probe, parry and thrust is the game plan until the enemy is down. Once down, the enemy must be finally slain by mop-up. Covering stumps, felling snags, pumping water and reinforcing lines is hard work and less dramatic than fighting the running fire, but it's every bit as essential. Demobilization of the big fire organization is the reverse process to assembling it. It may be progressive or partial, but never complete until the fire is dead out. When one or more sectors are made safe, others may be handled by fewer men. A reduced force can usually carry on patrols and mop-up. Demobilization consists of calling men and equipment off the line, posting firefighters' time, recording equipment use, inventorying supplies and foodstuff, returning tools and equipment, transporting men home, and paying bills. A board of review composed of the fire boss and project fire overhead is highly recommended when demobilization is complete. As we've seen, the fire boss has been the general in this combat mission. He had overall responsibility and authority. Suppression responsibilities were delegated to the line boss. Intelligence responsibilities were delegated to the plans boss and supplies and service responsibilities to the service boss. Staff advisor on air operations was the air advisor. The fire boss was the strategist and the manager. At the board of review meeting, this headquarters team can analyze their successes and failures, their weaknesses and strengths. Their object is to improve Project Fire organization.